Welcome to this edition of the Laissez Faire Books audio tape series. I'm David Bowes, your host for the series. Today we'll be talking about a subject near and dear to my heart why government is the problem. Before we begin an intensive session of blaming all of America's problems on the government, I'd like to offer a few words from Samuel Johnson as an invocation. How small of all that human hearts endure, that part which laws or kings can cause or cure. That's an important admonition for those who promise a new law for every human complaint. But I suppose it's also a reminder to those of us who sometimes blame laws or kings for every complaint we have. Nevertheless, I certainly believe that many of our social ills can be traced back to ill-considered actions of government, and we'll hear a lot about that today. Our speaker today truly needs no introduction. Milton Friedman is one of the great scholars and one of the great advocates of human freedom of the 20th century. He achieved his greatest stature when he was awarded the 1976 Nobel Prize in Economic Science and his greatest fame when he hosted a 10-part television series in 1979, Free to Choose. But his important accomplishments began long before that. In 1946, he co-authored with another future Nobel laureate, George Stigler, a small book on the problems with rent control. In 1963, he published, along with Anna Schwartz, his scholarly magnum opus, A Monetary History of the United States, which made a powerful empirical case for the monetarist perspective on economics. And in 1962, he published, along with his wife Rose Friedman, what might have been his most influential book, Capitalism and Freedom, which was the pivotal book for a whole generation of free market intellectuals and activists. Professor Friedman spent most of his career at the University of Chicago and is now a scholar at the Hoover Institution, from which he travels across the country and the world, making a case for sound economics and human freedom. It's a great pleasure to introduce Milton Friedman. Thank you, David. Your quote from Johnson reminded me of another quote from his contemporary, Adam Smith, in which I have always taken uh, some solace when I consider the stupid things we're doing to ourselves. Uh, when Yorktown fell, in the, in the Revolutionary War, uh, a young man came to Adam Smith and said, you know, the defeated Yorktown is going to be the ruined nation of England. And Adam Smith said to him, young man, he said, there's a deal of ruin in a nation. Well, that's a very wise comment, that uh, a nation is more than a government. It's a people, it's a set of institutions. And if there weren't a deal of ruin in a nation, the U.S. would be gone long since. I think it's an absolute miracle given what we've been subjected to, that we have as high a standard of life and as, as uh, a productive a society as we have. But it's not because of the government, it's despite the government. Many people argue that uh, it's absurd to say that the government is a problem. They refer to it as a specious fallacy of a re introduced and promoted by the Reagan years. But I do not believe it is. But I have two tasks that I want to perform in this talk. The first is to demonstrate that government is the problem. And the second, which is much harder, and in which I cannot say I have a really satisfactory answer, is why government is the problem. Why is it that we do things as a community, which we would never do as individuals, that our collective wisdom seems to be very different from our individual wisdom? Demonstrating that government is a problem is very simple. We need merely ask, what are the major social problems that face this country today and what gave rise to them? And uh, to take the words of a popular song, let's count the ways. Uh, first, schooling. Everybody will agree that the U.S. schooling system is in a state of serious disrepair. But schooling is next to the military the most completely socialist activity in the United States. Total government expenditures on schooling have in the past been very close to military expenditures, and I suspect that they will exceed military expenditures very shortly if they don't already as we wind down the military. So it is the major socialist enterprise in the United States. And it is performed just as all socialist enterprises do, and there's nothing to be surprised at it. Why should we be better at socialism than Russia is? They've had more experience. They ought to be better than we are. 
But consider the schooling system. All socialist enterprises have certain characteristics. They produce a poor quality product at a very high cost. They, however, they benefit very much a small group and they harm very much a large group. And the small group that's benefited is typically at the top of the economic and social scale and the large group that's harmed is typically at the bottom. That was true of all the socialist enterprises in the Soviet Union. It's true of schooling. Uh, in the past 30 years, the amount of money spent, the amount of government money spent per child has tripled after allowing for inflation. And yet the output and the results have been going down. You, no, I don't need to argue about the poor quality and about the inefficiency. But you'll ask me who's benefited and who's harmed. Well, there are two classes of beneficiaries. There are, first of all, the bureaucrats, the educational bureaucracy, the people at the state and local level, and the teacher, the administrative, the uh, bureaucrats in the teachers' unions. But there are second, there's a second class of beneficiaries, and they are people who live in wealthy suburbs. They do have some control over their schools, and if you look at the good schools in the United States, the good government schools, not the private schools, they're almost all in very wealthy suburbs, in Marin County or in uh, Bronxville or in uh, uh, the upper suburbs of Chicago. From the point of view of the residents, they are not really government schools. They are tax shelters. If they sent their children to private schools, the tuition they paid would have to come out of after-tax income, after federal tax income. But if they pay local taxes to finance their schools, it comes out of before-tax income. It's not subject to tax by the government. So they benefit. Who's harmed? There's no question. The people in the inner city, the uh, people in the slums of and ghettos of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, you name it, they are the people who get the worst schooling. There's no respect in which low-income people are worse off than the United States than in the kind of schooling their children can get. So schooling, a major problem in many ways created by the government. We have an enormous amount of lawlessness and crime in the United States. Homicides are very high, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Is it because over the course of the last 50 or 60 years, people have become more criminal or something? Not at all. A very large fraction of it all is attributable to government attempts to prohibit the use and sale of what are called drugs. I say what are called drugs because <laughs> the illegal drugs are only a small fraction of all drugs. Alcohol kills far more people than uh, the illegal drugs. There's no comparison. There's not a single recorded case of a death from overdose of marijuana in 2,000 years. <laughs> but so there are a class of illegal drugs that are prohibited. The intention is fine, of course. None of this problem arises because of bad intention. The intentions are fine, but the results are absolutely disgraceful, both domestically and internationally. We destroy Colombia because we can't enforce our own laws. I've estimated that roughly 10,000 homicides a year are attributable to the prohibition of drugs, over and above what they would be if we hadn't launched a war on drugs first, most recent, well, uh, really with Nixon in 1972 and more recently with Reagan and Bush. We have an epidemic of homelessness. Again, what produced it? In considerable part, it's rent controls, it's poor, poor public housing policies which have destroyed more housing than they've constructed. It's the early release of people from, uh, in, from uh, mental institutions, almost entirely produced by governmental measures. We've got a terrible weakening of the family, teenage pregnancy, illegitimate births. You only have to read Charles uh, uh, Murray's Losing Ground to understand that a major fraction of that a major part of that disaster derives from misguided government welfare and so-called anti-poverty uh, policies. Everybody complains about the high housing cost. It is true, the cost of building houses is very high, and roughly a quarter or more of the current costs are directly attributable to, uh, to building rules and building regulations imposed by local uh, communities.
and it's very far from clear that in any way they uh, really perform their functions. Medical care used to be 4% of national income spent on net medical care, now it's 13%, and the explosive rise in costs dates from the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. It's been go excessive government involvement that has produced a crisis in medical care. It's easy to name others, the SNL crisis, the weakness in financial institutions. We have congestion on highways. Somehow or other, private industry can build all the cars anybody wants to drive, but the government can build the highways for them to run on. Private enterprise has been able to provide all the airplanes that, air, uh, that airlines want to use. And they've been able to provide the service for the airlines, but the airlines can't find adequate landing places. They get delays at airports. Why? Because the airports are government. And I haven't even mentioned the botched economic policies. I haven't even mentioned such things as tariffs and quotas, such things as wage and hour laws, uh, such things as government regulations, Clean Air Acts, Aid to Disability Acts, which have imposed very heavy regulatory costs on business. So clearly, a great many of our problems do date back to government policies. Now, none of this means that government doesn't have a real role. Of course it does. And one of the major tragedies of our time is that because government is involved in doing so many things it has no business doing, it doesn't do the things that it alone, in my opinion, can do, uh, that it ought to do. The first function of government is to protect the nation from foreign enemies and individual citizens from coercion by their fellow citizens. And our crime and murder statistics demonstrate amply that we're not doing that very well. I wonder if the liberal pundits who claim that the problem is not that government uh, is a problem, but simply that people are stingy and don't want to turn over enough of their money to the government to spend for them, can name any corresponding major problem that derives from the private sphere. Their knee-jerk answer will, of course, be pollution. But that's not very clear. Uh, as a result of the collapse of East European countries, we've had a small sample of the difference between pollution in a 100% government environment and pollution in a free enterprise environment. If you want to see pollution, real honest-to-God pollution, go to Poland and over Huta to the steel mill there. You can't see the steel mill for the pollution. And uh, Russia is in a terrible state so far as pollution is concerned. Here, too, a fuller analysis would show that many of our so-called pollution problems are produced by government. I conclude the first part of my brief. Government is the problem. Why? As I said, that's a much more difficult problem. Why is it that we have done these things? One common explanation, and one that I have often stressed, and that certainly plays a role, is the influence of special interests. <coughs> Certainly, there, that's a valid explanation for things like agricultural subsidies. We get agricultural subsidies because each farmer each gets a large benefit from them. Each consumer pays a small price. And so we get agricultural subsidies. Same thing is true for many tariffs and restrictions. But it clearly is not an adequate explanation. It doesn't, for example, explain... <coughs> <clears throat> the success of private enterprise. It isn't vested interest that means that the government can run a, run a post office while privately organized Federal Express and United Parcel Service can run rings around the government and take their business away. It doesn't explain why government activities always cost at least twice as much as when the same thing is done privately. <clears throat> One answer that's given to that is that, well, in the private industry, you have the incentive of profit. In the government, the incentive is to serve the public. Uh, 
and the incentive of profit is stronger than the incentive of public service. Now, I think that explanation is right in one sense and wholly wrong in another. The people who run the private enterprises have exactly the same incentives as the people who run the government enterprises. Armin Alchin, a marvelous professor at the University of California at Los Angeles, once put it very well. He said, you know, there's one thing you can depend on absolutely everybody for. You can depend on absolutely everybody to put his interest above yours. Now, that, <laughs> that reveals a real honest-to-God truth. The incentive of people in government, like the incentive of people in the private sphere, is to serve their own interest, to promote their own interest. That incentive is universal. The people in government are no different from the people in the private enterprise. If you reversed them, if you took all of the people out of government and put them to run the private enterprises and took all of the people in private enterprises and put them, to, them in to run the government, but you didn't change anything about the structure of incentives or anything, the results would be the same. It wouldn't be any different. The problem isn't that the right people aren't in government. The, uh, the, uh, the problem, the difference is that private interest leads you to do different things in the two capacities. If you're in one capacity, you will do one thing. If you're in another, you'll do another. You have different bottom lines. <clears throat> Suppose you're a private entrepreneur and you start a venture, delivering mail, if there were no post office, for example, something that might be done either by government or by private enterprise. There are lots of new enterprises started every year. And as we all know, most of them go broke. Uh, out of every hundred new enterprises, three or four or five years later, there are probably only about a third of them still in existence. All new ventures are subject to risk, but if you start a private enterprise and it's a failure, your choice is very clear. You either close it down or you finance it out of your own pocket. That's your bottom line. And so the incentive to close it down is very strong. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you uh, start the same enterprise in the government sphere, exactly the same enterprise, and it performs exactly the same way. It doesn't work, it's a failure, it's losing money. You have another alternative. Nobody likes to admit he was wrong. It's much more pleasant to you to say to yourself, it wasn't that I started the wrong enterprise. It's just that I haven't done it on a large enough scale. If I had only done it on a little larger scale, it would have been okay. And you don't have to dig into your own pocket to do it on a larger scale with a perfectly good conscience. You can say it's in the public interest to do it on a larger scale, and if you have enough political savvy and power, you can dig into the taxpayer's pocket, and that's a lot deeper than your own. And you yourself have a lot less concern about picking the, uh, uh, digging your hand in the taxpayer's pocket than in your own. And so that's what happens. <clears throat> and that's the sense in which the incentive is right, is is tr is. Uh, different, but not because people have different interests, not because the profit incentive is stronger than the incentive for public service, but that the same incentive operating in the two sets of institutions leads you to two different things. I've formulated the rule. If a private enterprise is a failure, it's a closed down. It's closed down. If a government enterprise is a failure, it's expanded. And I find it very hard to find any exceptions to that rule. So I don't believe, as I say, as I said before, it's not that the people in government are different any more than the people in Hong Kong were different people than the people in communist China. And yet Hong Kong had four, five, six, ten times as high a standard of living as China. It's because the institutions were different. The people in West Germany are no different from the people in East Germany. It isn't different kinds of people that explain why the communist regime in East Germany produced a mid-dismal standard of living. It's that the institutions are different, and the same thing is true here. What happens is that the institutions are different, and that the personal interest operates in one way in the private sector, and in the other way in the government sector. I think that's a very large part of the explanation.
for what goes on. My wife and I wrote a book after Free to Choose was published called The Tyranny of the Status Quo. And the title of that book illustrates what happens. Once you get a government enterprise started, it's very difficult to get rid of it because you now have vested interests which are created in the process of starting that enterprise. And you have what we call the Iron Triangle, the congressional committee that uh, has, has passed the law establishing it and that supervises it and that gets uh, campaign contributions from people who benefit from it. The government bureaucrats who started it, who are involved in it, who administer it, and are anxious to expand their role and become more important. The group of people who happen to benefit from it, the post office employees in the case of the post office. <clears throat> the liberal pundits will tell you that the source of the problem is that the public wants the goodies that government provides, but it doesn't want to pay for them. That may be partly right in some cases, but it's very far from the whole truth. The truth of the matter is that the public doesn't have any say. <clears throat> Nobody will tell me, to take a very clear and simple example, that if you had a referendum for the people at large saying, you have a choice, you're gonna have sugar, which is produced in the United States from beets that are grown, or you can have sugar from the outside world. However, you'll have to pay twice as much for the sugar from homegrown beets as for the sugar from the outside world. Do you think, does anybody in his right mind think that all but a few beet sugar farmers would vote for that? And yet that's exactly the situation we have. We have <clears throat> import quotas on sugar, which have therefore been there for a long time, but were in considerable part um, expanded for a reason that has nothing to do with their present existence. It was expanded as a way of getting back at Cuba when Cuba went communist. It was, the system was uh, made more complex in order to be able to embargo, to put in a limit on Cuban sugar and hurt Cuba. <clears throat> But once you've got it in, then you've got a very potent group. The fact is that the people don't get to vote on it. And that's true for many a thing. Every time the people have had a chance to vote, not on the specific issue of themselves, but on the broader issue of the role they want to assign to government, they have voted against making government too powerful. That's why Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. That's also why Proposition 13 was passed in California. It's also why Proposition 4 in California, which set a limit on total government spending, was passed. You do not have a graduated income tax in Connecticut today because the people wanted it. They protested like men against it, but Governor Weicker wanted it, and that's why you have it. <clears throat> More important than that, however, about this liberal explanation that uh, people are stingy and don't want to pay enough taxes is that the major problem we have is that government is spending too much, not that it's spending too little. The uh, schooling I mentioned, what's the problem with schooling? That we're spending too much on the wrong things. What's the problem with medical care? That we're spending too much on the wrong things. Over and over again, we're spending too much on things that the public has never voted for. I was very much uh, uh, impressed a while back when I, by, a, by a book and a study by James Payne, in which he reported the results of an analysis of the, te of the people who testified before congressional committees on spending programs. I don't know, he took quite a group of them, a half a dozen or so of these, and all in all, he had over a thousand witnesses he analyzed. Now, I wasn't surprised when he found that the witnesses for the spending outnumbered the witnesses against spending 150 to one. That's what you would expect. <clears throat> the people to take, this isn't a spending case, but to take the sugar case, <clears throat> 
Any consumer of sugar in the United States probably costs $10, $20 a year extra because of that. But no such sugar, no such consumer has any incentive to go to Washington and testify against those quotas. It just simply isn't important enough. They ha it's what the economists call rational ignorance not to testify. On the other hand, the small number of beet sugar farmers, each of whom gets a lot of money, makes a lot out of this, have a strong incentive. So I'm not surprised by that. What really surprised me was his analysis of who the witnesses were. And it turned out, according to his study, that 47% were federal administrators. Another 10% were state and local officials. An additional 6% were congressmen themselves. So that what you had was that 63% of the witnesses were from the government. As he concluded, overwhelmingly, Congress's views on spending programs are shaped by governments themselves. What has happened <clears throat> is that the government has become a self-generating monstrosity. It runs itself. Abraham Lincoln once said, government of the people, by the people, for the people. The modern version of that would be government of the people, by the bureaucrats, for the bureaucrats. And I include in the bureaucrats the congressmen. Because being a legislator has become a profession. It's no longer a public service. It's a lifelong profession. That's, the pro that's why <clears throat> you have so little turnover in Congress. That's why you have a lifelong uh, tenure. So they fundamentally are bureaucrats. And as James Payne always also showed, the longer they're in office, the more partial they are to government expansion the more partial they are to having the government spend more of your and my money on our behalf. Again, let me emphasize, all government programs are for good intentions. But there's a famous saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And that's the case here. So we're headed the wrong way, in my opinion. Not because we have bad people not because we have bad motives, because we have gradually developed governmental institutions under which the public essentially has no voice. Now, it wasn't always that way. Up until 1930, total government spending in the United States never exceeded about 10 to 12 percent of the national income. And two-thirds of that was state and local. It's very hard to realize that except for the major wars, the Civil War and the First World War, the federal government never spent more than about 3 to 4% of the national income. Half of that went for the military, and half went for everything else. <clears throat> State and local governments spent the remaining two-thirds, and that was very widely uh, diversified. About half of it, I guess, went for schooling and roads. And I'm not sure what the other half went for. But when government was spending 12% of the national income, you didn't have a bureaucracy that was able to silence the voice of the people. And so government played a much smaller role. The people did have something to say. And congressmen, people who went to senators and so on, there were some who served a long life, who had a long career, but the turnover was much greater than it is now. Of course, I must say, another factor that contri has contributed very strongly uh, to the expansion of the power of the federal government has been air conditioning. It used to be, before air conditioning, that Congress wanted to have short terms because Washington is such a hellhole to live in in the summertime. And so you always had very short terms. Once air conditioning came along, terms gradually got longer and longer, and now it's essentially a full year business, and people can make a career out of being in Congress. <clears throat> it's an interesting example of how very good things can have side effects that are terrible. Air conditioning is wonderful. It's hard for us to understand how we could get along without it. <laughs>
yet it's also had this bad effect. Well, I come back. Why is government the problem? It is partly that we do have too many vested interests, which are able to manipulate government for their own purpose. But as I've argued, I don't believe that it's a, that's our real problem. Our real problem is that we're unable to practice what we preach. What we preach is free markets. What we practice is socialism. Here we've had the most remarkable phenomenon of our lifetime, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. As an economist, I wish I were 20 years younger so I could live to see how it's going to work out because it's the most interesting actual experiment in my lifetime from an economic point of view. But we all recognize what was the problem in Eastern Europe. We all recognize that the problem was that governments were too big, too intrusive, too bureaucratic. And we are telling the Eastern Europe, you've got to privatize, you've got to establish free markets, you've got to establish private property. But we don't seem to take that lesson for ourselves. What, have, what lesson have we drawn from what's happened in Eastern Europe? As I see it, what we've drawn, the lesson we've drawn, we're doing everything right. They all want to become like us. And so we must be doing everything right. But I think that's the wrong lesson. It's a strange situation. <clears throat> we in the United States are moving toward where the Eastern European countries were, while the Eastern European countries are trying to move to where we were. They're trying to move to our free market image, to the fact that for 150 years we had an essentially free society, which enabled us to build up the wealth, which enabled us today to afford so much waste. They can't afford that waste. They have to go back and build up the capital. But I'm uh, leaving a little, I'm departing a little from my main line of reasoning. What can we do about it? How can we people make our voice effective? I'm not really pessimistic about that from the long run point of view. The American people recognize a problem in large part. The most recent reason for optimism, in my opinion, is the very great momentum behind the movement for term limits. Term limits would really change the institutional structure in a fundamental way. I don't think we're going to get any way by, by uh, trying to get Congress to change its little rules. The incentives are going to remain the same. You're not going to get anywhere by small fiddling around changes. If you're going to make a difference, you have to have a basic change in our institutional arrangements. And the only basic change that's on the horizon at the moment is term limits. I think that would be a very healthy change. <clears throat> that's also the conclusion that James Payne came to in his book, and for much the same reasons. And it looks as if the American people are going to do it. Again, the American people are, understand very well that taxes are too high and government spending is too high. People say, well, how can they big that be when the Congress that elects them, the American people elect them? But that's a fallacy. <clears throat> when an individual votes for his own congressman, he knows that he's not going to affect total national policy. And therefore, he might as well try to get as big a slice for himself as he can. And so there's no incompatibility and the people in saying that if the public could really vote on it, they'd be in favor of cutting spending across the board. On the other hand, nobody's going to be in favor of spending, of cutting his own goody while everybody else benefits and doesn't. And so when you vote for your own congressman, you're perfectly rational to judge him on how much booty he brings home, how much bacon he brings to your little uh, constituency. The problem is, how do you get a vote on the broader issue? 
Those states like California that have referenda and initiative have a way of doing it. And I think if you were going to have another major institutional change, it ought to be to establish a national referendum process whereby the public at large could vote directly, <clears throat> not on the little issues, but on the big question. What should be the total limit on the government budget? What should be the total highest level of tax rates? What should be the total amount of taxes? Things like that. And given the extent of dissatisfaction in the community with what's going on, I'm reasonably optimistic for the long run, but I'm not very optimistic for the near future. So far as the near future is concerned, we seem simply to be moving down the same road that has led us to where we are now. That's a very mixed conclusion on which to end, but that's where I'm going to end. Welcome back to our discussion of government's role in creating society's problems. Eamon Butler, one of Milton Friedman's intellectual biographers, noted that his later books, Free to Choose and The Tyranny of the Status Quo, cited far more examples of failed government intervention than did capitalism and freedom. Partly, Butler suggested, because the earlier book was intentionally more theoretical, but also because the growth of government had provided many new examples of failure. I think we've just heard Milton Friedman discuss some examples that have arisen since the publication of Free to Choose. Joining Milton Friedman and me now for an unrehearsed, unedited discussion of social problems are David Henderson, editor of the Fortune Encyclopedia of Economics, Sally Pipes, president of the Pacific Research Institute in San Francisco, and Hannes Gisserarsson, professor of politics at the University of Iceland. Hannes? Yes, I'm a European and I come occasionally to this country and uh, I would like to uh, put to you a puzzlement which I have about it because I tend to agree with uh, the rest uh, of you perhaps that the uh, government is very often the problem. It is when I watch TV, because when I watch the, the public broadcasting service, I get much better programs, much more interesting, much more entertaining, much more informative than when I watch the privately produced uh, TV channels. So what can be the explanation for this? I find it uh, very convincing, which has been said by Milton in his uh, talk, that uh, private enterprise uh, produces uh, excellent airplanes and uh, moves us from one place to another, but it is government which messes it up in the airports, which are uh, publicly controlled and owned and so on. But here we have an example, it seems to me, where for us Europeans it is uh, rather obvious that uh, government uh, subsidized uh, enterprise produces a better product uh, than the privately uh, owned and controlled one. Government, government doesn't subsidize any enterprise. Government doesn't have any money. Right. Taxpayer subsidies. Sure, yes, but the point really is right. that some means of, uh, of production are uh, politically controlled, subsidized by taxpayers' money, but some are not, and uh, this I've, is an example. I've got an answer, Hans. David. Oh, okay, I've got an answer. First of all, two words, get cable, because what you were saying would have been right 10 years ago. It really isn't right anymore. On cable, you've got arts and entertainment, you've got HBO, you've got the Disney Channel, which my daughter loves. Now, yeah. why do you have why do you have better programming on cable? Because they can cater to a particular audience and charge a high price for that. Whereas the way we used to have it, the only way to pay for programming was with advertising. So you had to reach a large enough audience, and that's why you got the lousy programming. Which is also I I maintain why programming is even worse now on the on the advertising paid channels than it was to me. Sally, and I'd like to say, well, perhaps it is. I mean, who it's better in whose whose view? That's right. Is, is it in your view? I mean, or and maybe it's only a few people that are watching it, and the government is is providing it, i.e., through taxpayers' money. Well, well I mean, we had a lot of evidence on this for British. I think Sally's point. Both of these points are right, but they attach attack different aspects of it. Uh, David's explanation explains explains it from the point of view of the. Uh, structure of, tele of radio or television, and of course, that structure itself owes itself to government. The reason cable was introduced so late, and the reason you didn't have pay TV was because government would per wouldn't permit it. Right. The problem that, from this point of view, the uh, your point of view, it's a government-created problem, another one, that you had a system of a limited number of licenses, and they were subject to control by the Federal Communications Commission. They were... Uh, for many, many years, 
the over-the-air broadcasters tried to get pay TV, and government wouldn't. The FCC prohibited them from doing pay TV. So I think what you're describing as coming from cable would have come from over-the-air TV if it hadn't been for government intervention. But I think Sally also makes a very, very important point. I remember once a study for British Broadcasting, BBC, in which there was, in Britain, what was it, Channel 3 was the high intellectual channel? And something like 1% of the people watched Channel 3, but something like 5 or 10% of the total money was going to Channel 3. And what Hannes is describing is a situation in the United States where taxpayers are subsidizing the uh, poor taxpayers, the people in, in Watts and Harlem, are, ta- uh, uh, are subsidizing uh, so-called public television, government television, uh, which is uh, uh, appealing to the taste of a very small number. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, audiences, the viewing population for public P- or PBS has never been very large. It's always been something like one or two percent, three percent. I think our free to choose program drew an almost record audience, and I think it drew something like two point eight percent. I remember. <laughs> So let tell me, Johannes, I want to ask you, why should those poor suckers in Harlem have to pay so you can have good television? Well, I, I take your point to some extent, <laughs> and in fact, I thought it was just my duty to act as the devil's advocate here, that my complaint is more about the taste of the American public than about uh, the arrangements that the Americans have chosen. And, uh, well, people are entitled to have their tastes, provided they are not committing violence on other people. So I would, to some extent, uh, agree, but that brings us to um, a different uh, problem that one can find with the classical liberal or libertarian position, which is this, that uh, the classical liberals seem not to make, in my opinion, a clear distinction enough between uh, uh, our um, wants and desires on the one hand and the ideals and aspirations we may have on the other hand. And this may explain a paradox, a basic paradox in your position, Milton, which is this. You take agriculture as an example, and uh, it seems to us that it may be reasonable to pay the farmers off. They would profit by being paid off. Uh, They are subsidized, it costs the taxpayers money, they are not terribly well off, and so on. Why don't they then accept it? Because it uh, is in conflict with their self-image, with the ideals and aspirations, with their identity. And it seems to me that here is something lacking in the whole thing, uh, because it explains away uh, uh, the public choice approach that you outlined in your talk, uh, the uh, uh, the image of man as seeking his own interest, it explains away the possibility uh, for political reforms, and it also does not take uh, sufficiently into account uh, the identities and self-images and aspirations uh, that people have. Isn't it so? You've raised a complicated problem, and I think it has to be separated into its parts. Uh, I think that one of the problems is how you interpret interests. Uh, in my opinion, Mother uh, Teresa is serving her self-interest. Interest is not narrowly financial. Interest is, goes beyond yourself. You can get reform because the public at large is, has interests other. The self-interest of people is not only how much money they make, but what kind of a society they live in. It's uh, what happens to other people. It's sympathy for other people as well as for themselves. And that is why you can get reform. And indeed, one of the objections I have to uh, the governmental activity is that it has always, it has tended to uh, make impotent the minority of people who are seeking to do something very different from the norm. Uh, The uh, progress of uh, values and the progress of Civilization, in a sense, has always depended on a very small minority, on what Albert J. Nock called the remnant. Uh, it's always depended on that small minority. The uh, uh, substituting government for private decision tends to render that minority impotent. Uh, but you certainly are correct in raising the problem about the self-image of the farmers. They're right. Uh, they, uh, the same thing is happening now in the common market in Europe. The farmers believe that if the government fixes a price at an abnormally artificial price, 
that they're entitled to that price and that they're not being uh, uh, mendicants or beggars or or welfare recipients, and yet they are. By the way, I think there's a. I don't think they have turned it down. It hasn't been offered. If the government offered to pay each, it isn't landowners. It isn't farmers, by the way. They're paying landowners. Farmers don't necessarily benefit from farm programs. Landowners. Do. Well, we haven't and made. We haven't explicitly offered it to him. But I think Hannes has a point. In the first place, farmers like to farm. No, I mean, I, some people I actually think like if they were offered, plowing most the earth. Of them would say yes. And the reason they aren't offered it is to offer it would be to make the subsidy visible. And the people paying it would say no, and they would be up in arms. But it's I, th not, I think your sugar example, it's not that people say, oh, that, that cost me $20 a year. If it did, they probably wouldn't lobby. You're right. But they don't even know about it. They don't know about it. They don't, you know, sugar, what's that? Or sugar quota, what's that? But it, the quotas are just another form of hidden taxes, which right. are becoming governments are using more and more. That's right. And they, if you keep them hidden, you can keep them. Yes, but I think, I think, I don't question that that's right in large part. I think a lot of them would. But I think still, that Hannes has a point. And consider the case in the European common market and the French farmers. It is the French farmers who, who uh, uh, form protests, they march and so on, they destroy pigs, God knows what they do. Uh, and it, uh, uh, I think if you said to them, we're going to cut the prices down, we're going to have the market prices, but we'll give each of you a subsidy of X thousand dollars a year, they would feel that was demeaning. If they weren't earning that subsidy. And people do want to feel that they're earning what they're getting. So I think Hannes has a point. Even though what I think you're saying, and I agree with you, is that there's a high enough price that they'll give up. That yeah, right. Feeling. That's right. Everybody has, his, everybody has his price. Yeah, get a lump sum and do something else. I'd like to raise another point. First of all, Milton, I want to say that I hope you do live 20 more years. The odds are very small. I'm 79 years old now. And well, I can still hope. Um, second, I do want to take on what you said about medical care. I don't disagree that Medicare and Medicaid have added to the percent of GMP that gets spent on medical care. But I don't think they're necessarily the main explanation. No, they're, they're part. And I think the main explanation, it's funny no one's talking about this, but is that medical care actually works. 30 years ago, if something went wrong, you mean government taken, medical care? No, me, no, private, private medical care. Medical. Most, better most, science, most better med, technology. Yeah, most medical spending is still private, although government is creeping up as a percent. But 30 years ago, if you had something go wrong, you went into the hospital, and they let they watched you die, or you didn't even go into the hospital. And now w there was a huge, you know, uh, revolution in drugs and all kinds of surgeries and so on in the 60s and 70s, and we're getting something for it. You're you're right that medical care have been enormous advances in medical care, and they really could start with the 30s, the late 30s, with the uh, sulfonilamide and the beginning of the penicillin and the invention of the antibiotics. Uh, the I don't mean invention, yeah. discovery, yeah. finding of the antibiotics. You're absolutely right. There have been major improvements. I wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for I those improvements. Your operation in sure. The 70s. Yeah. However. I think there is another factor. However, I don't think the improvements justify the high price. And there's another factor that I should have mentioned, which is government, uh, in which the government is involved, which is at least as important as Medicare and Medicaid. And that is the uh, tax-free character of medical care provided by an employer to an employee. See, I agree, but that would explain a higher level of medical spending as a percent of GMP, but not a higher rate of increase, or not not a not a not an increase in that percent. You have a one-time increase when that becomes deductible, but unless marginal tax rates go up so that so that the deduction becomes more valuable, you shouldn't see that. Now you'd say you might say marginal tax rates didn't. Go no, up. no, no. I wouldn't say that. I would say that whenever you have a change, you see the thing I'm always amazed at is how long it takes for the rational to become the real. Mm. And yes. people react yeah. very slowly. Yeah. And they don't discover right away. And then you have these long negotiations between unions and employers. And only gradually do the employers discover that they can uh, offer the union something that's worth more than wages and so on. So I think you're right in principle that if everybody were rational and reacted immediately. And informed. And informed. I, I, was, I, became the, I was the health economist under Marty Phelps and yeah. Reagan White House. And it was shortly after learning all about all this stuff we're talking about that I started going to doctors. <laughs> <laughs> but, but David, I don't see why you say that you don't see why the percentage would continue to increase. Once we're in a situation where 
nobody cares how much his medical care costs. It's not nobody cares. Oh, no, not you nobody care cares. You care two-thirds. If your right. marginal tax rate is 33%, no, you no, care you, two-thirds. No, once you've got the insurance, you don't care how much it costs when you go to the doctor because the True. insurance is paying for it. True. So the doctor raises his prices $2 every week and nobody ever says, wait a minute, you're getting too expensive. But, oh, the, but, the, people who pay, but the people who pay for the medical care. But that's a much clumsier way to try to control it, it because it isn't it the is. consumer controlling it. And, and we are seeing why that David, happening. And that's why David says, and I say, that if you didn't have this tax deductibility, the tax-free character of it, there would be less spent. Yeah. But I also think there would be a long... Uh, uh, David, <laughs> there are too many Davids around here. <laughs> <laughs> David Henderson. I know, but I'm, lo- I'm now talking <laughs> okay, about okay. the other David, okay. David Bose. Along David Bose's line... I also think that you would have a more competitive and efficient market if individuals were taking care of their own medical care rather than having their employers make the array yes. on a large scale for lots of people. Right. And if you did not have the tax-free character of employer-provided medical care, I doubt very much uh, that uh, anything like the same fraction of medical care would be provided through the employer. Okay, and I, I guess what I would say is when you said it went from 4 to 13 and, and you made it sound like the whole reason for that is government, I'd say I think that's part of the reason. And maybe without tax deductibility, maybe without Medicare and Medicaid, it'd be 10 or something. But I think it would have been a major increase. No, no. Medicare it wouldn't have been that. Good. No, no, not at all. Yeah. No, no. Look, 4% would be a rising real amount. Right. Moreover, many of the advances in medical care have reduced the amount of medical care needed. Like drugs. Right, drugs and preventive drugs. Second place, I don't think you can explain that way, why the personnel per bed in hospitals, the number of people per bed, has multiplied sevenfold in the last 40 years. Hmm. Seven times as high. The cost per bed is 35 times as high. In real terms. Per patient day, in real terms. And you cannot explain by the improvements in medical care, medical care, anything like that. May I just? Uh, but I, Sally wants to say something here. Well, as a Canadian, I just want to just make a mention that I am absolutely appalled by all of the media and bureaucrats and politicians who are saying we in America now need to have a nationalized health care system based on Canada's health care system. And it sounds like it's cheap and it's wonderful. And we never hear hear what the problems with Canada's health care system, a 20 year old system are considering queuing, rationing of services, um, the fact that there aren't a lot of treatments that are available in America are now no longer able to be provided in Canada because it's too expensive on the health care system. So a lot of the things, the things that save Milton, if the U.S. has a health care system, where are we going to go to have the latest innovative um, techniques um, if this does come about? And it's appalling that people at Heritage and NCPA and AEI are doing great work, and yet our findings don't seem to be reaching the people that we want them to reach. You come from, you are from, coming from Vancouver, and am I right that the British Columbia made a deal with uh, Seattle Hospital to uh, do bypass operations for a very large number of heart patients? Well, what happened was we have a monopoly provider, so it's not even like in the UK where you can have um, private insurance and running side by side. So what happens when you have a monopoly is that, say, the nurses decide to go on strike well, that shuts down the whole medical system. So what happens to all these people who are waiting for desperate surgery? They're going to either die or they're going to have to go somewhere else to the U.S. And there was, there's was there been many more strikes in recent years because of this monopoly situation. So we had people dying, so the government had to do something following a strike. So they sent 208 patients to Seattle to have heart bypass done. <laughs> well, you're right. Where are they going to go now? I mean, if, if we have that kind of a system here. You're right. It's a, it's a story that isn't getting out. I mean, if you if you pick up any newspaper, you'll see everybody in Canada likes the health care system, and it works a lot better than ours. It's it's. Uh, and we are clearly headed the march toward socialized medicine in this country. David Henderson, do you think it can be stopped? Oh, I think it can be stopped. And fortunately, I, and I agree with you, there's a march. But fortunately, we have the deficit, <laughs> and and I don't think no, no, I don't think it's going to go very quickly. No, no, because the route we're going to take is the mandating it on employers. Okay, no, I think that that will happen, but that's that's still only a step. Well, it's a pretty big step. But let me ask you a question based on something you said earlier, Milton. If we had a national referendum, don't you think we'd have national health insurance by now? 
We'd not have had it 10 years ago. It's been 80% in the polls every time I've been asked. Uh, but polls don't include the uh, cost. Well, Actually, neither will the referendum question. No, well, the question is how the referendum is taken. Well, that's, that's right. That it, is it, right. It, it makes a big difference how it's worded, but if... But if it Senator is, Kennedy is, wrote his bill and is. put it on there, it would say, and there'd be a CBO study saying it was going to save ten billion dollars mm -hmm. a year in administrative mm -hmm. costs. I don't know what how the people would vote on that. They might very well vote for it. Uh, if you look at the record of uh, California uh, initiatives or state initiatives in general, there have been some very bad ones. For example, last year in California, they passed a terrible proposition on education. That was Bill Honig's. Uh, dece most deceptive kind of advertising you can possibly imagine. Which uh, legislated that you have to spend a certain percentage of the state's budget on education. Which broke. No, which did worse than that. There had been the so-called GAN amendment, which set a total limit on the aggregate amount that could be spent. Honig's amendment broke that limit for education, and only education. Anyway, uh, on the other hand, if you look at the whole average of a number of studies have been made which have been shown that they are on the whole much more fiscally responsible than what the legislature does. They're on the side of lower government and not higher government relative to what the legislature does. Last year, for example, the term limit uh, proposal, which was passed overwhelmingly, the uh, proposition was 170. I've lost count. Yeah, I know. It's very hard to keep count of these numbers. five, I think. But, sure. but anyway, whatever it was, it was a proposition that pr imposed term limits uh, on state legislatures. Unfortunately, unlike the Colorado one, it did not limit the terms of our congressmen. But uh, so that undoubtedly referenda would not be a be-all and end-all. And there would be some bad things. And maybe I'm wrong that that would be a desirable change. Well, I think you're right because uh, the experience in Switzerland has been that uh, the voters, they have been rather conservative in terms of spending because they are the people who have to pay the bill. So, and uh, typically the referenda in Switzerland are about whether to spend this amount of money on this project and they usually turn it down. However, may there not be another problem with uh, referenda's means of deciding what to do and what not to, not to do, which is the moral issue. Because it seems to me that one, uh, as you correctly pointed out just before, one of the good things about capitalism is that it enables minorities to flourish in the little corners because if they've got the purchasing power, then they can isolate themselves from political pressures. But if we begin to use referenda, then it may uh, become referenda on moral issues, and it seems to me that then these minorities may get a rather rough deal. Isn't that a danger as well? That's a danger of our present system as well. That is, it's a danger of democracy. That's why no, none of us isn't nobody. You know, people talk about being in favor of democracy, and people talk about identifying democracy with majority rule. But I venture to say there's not a single person in the country who believes in, in majority rule as a principle. If you went around and asked people, 60% of the people vote to shoot the other 40%, would that be a, an appropriate expression of majority rule? You won't find a single person in the country who will say yes. Nobody believes in majority rule as a principle. So you have to have two stages. You have to have some kind of a limit on government. That was what the, constitu our, the, the framers of the Constitution tried to do in the Constitution and did very effectively. Unfortunately, we've interpreted the Constitution out of existence. We are no longer really doing things. It seems to me much of what we now do is clearly in terms of the framers' intentions, unconstitutional. You know, whether you take rent control, whether you take uh, land use legislation, you can go all over the lot. Uh, so you're quite right. We need to have some limits. I'm not proposing that the referenda be uh, on everything. I don't believe we ought to have a referendum on whether people should be free to speak, for example. Uh, so I think we do need a Bill of Rights, and we do need limits, and unfortunately, the difficulty is, how do you get limits imposed once you've broken those limits? In many ways, it's always seemed to me that one can make a strong intellectual case that a free society is an unstable equilibrium position, if I may use some technical economic term. That is to say that it's an accident if it's achieved. And it surely has been an accident wherever it's been achieved. 
Mansur Olson's book, The Rise and Decline of Nations, made it look like uh, you have to lose a war mm-hmm. once your state gets too big. <laughs> There's no other way to, to sweep away the accumulation well, of interests right. and institutions. And look, how, look where free societies come from. Why was Hong Kong a free society? The freest economic system in the world, uh, almost completely free human freedom, no restrictions on speech or writing, no political freedom whatsoever. It wasn't that the people of Hong Kong chose freedom, it was imposed on them right. by a socialist by, government. N- by a socialist government <laughs> that didn't care the, enough about them to impose socialism. No, on them. I don't believe that's right. I believe they, they, they wanted to send the free market people out of Britain, and they sent them to Hong Kong. <laughs> so, Milton, would you say, getting on to that issue of freedom, that, that if a country has economic freedom and, and, and not political freedom, that those countries are going to survive and, and prosper? Say, Chile. No, has, I wouldn't say that. You can't, you can't make that conclude. you can't draw that conclusion. It depends on how you define economic freedom. The question is, would you describe, for example, uh, well, first of all, you have a question of prosperity, and the second of all, you have a question of I think there are three aspects of freedom that need to be distinguished. Economic freedom, human freedom, things like free speech, civil, civil, free assembly, freedom. civil freedom, and then political freedom, which is just all what people mean by that, is the freedom to vote for the representative. Now, uh, I think economic freedom tends to lead to human freedom, and tends to lead to political freedom, but the problem is that political freedom once attained tends to undermine economic and human freedom. Well, while you're... And I don't know that that's necessary. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying if you look around the world and look at history, the record of history, uh, that seems to have been the case. Like if you compare Chile and, and Peru, how would you... Well, the question is, it's a very, a very difficult question. You're right. Uh, in Chile, it was clearly a military junta. But I don't think you want to take that as a regular rule because the real miracle in Chile was not its economic success. Its economic success was simply a result of the fact that it took free market positions. The real miracle in Chile was that the military junta was willing to support a free market. The military juntas in general have been strongly centralized and opposed to free market because the principle of a military is the opposite of the principle of a free market. A military is organized from the top down, the general to, to the colonel, et cetera. The, uh, a free market is organized from the bottom up. The consumer says to the retailer, the retailer says to the wholesaler, and so on. And so it's really a miracle. And the only reason why the Chile Junta supported the free market group was they had no other alternative. When the military in Chile first overthrew Allende, inflation was running about 500% a year. They tried to get the military to run Chile, and a year later it was 1,000% a year. And in desperation, they had to do something, and they turned to the Chicago boys and, and, and let them, gave them, gave them a free hand. Well, that, that raises a point that I want to take on, and that is that it does seem, it does seem that people matter. It does seem that you said, you know, it doesn't matter who's in power, various things happen, but it does seem to matter who's in power in many cases. And in fact, if you really believed it didn't, it wouldn't matter, then I think you'd have to be more pessimistic than you are. Well, I can't disagree with you. I think most, uh, it depends on what matters. All I'm saying is the if you people shuffle, who are the bureaucrats, yeah. if you shuffled them, it wouldn't yeah. make a bit of difference. Right. But individual people can occasionally matter. I'm not going to say, for example, that Ronald Reagan didn't matter. I or think he mattered a great deal. Well, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but Adam Smith certainly mattered. Right. Friedrich von Hayek certainly mattered. So people do Cobden matter. Cobden and Bright. What? Cobden and Bright. Cobden and Bright mattered. Well, even in government, people. Alfred Kahn mattered. We wouldn't have gotten right. deregulation of the airlines if they had That's put true. A, a different economist in as head of the That's agency. Right. That's true, but those are the exceptions. Fairly short-term issue. And they are the exceptions. Right. Right. So... Uh, my shuffling thing had to do with the... And I, do, right. I agree with you. Yeah. Right. Well, I would tend to agree with you that freedom is a fragile flower. And, uh, but it seems to me, though, that uh, at this juncture in history, when we are um, nearing the, the end of the 20th century and socialism has collapsed and it, it does seem to lose its uh, credibility even where it still lingers on, uh, that uh, we may be returning, though, to the kind of evolutionary defenses for uh, classical liberalism or libertarianism that we 
that people used in the in the 19th century. But um, I cannot resist here throwing out an example of how capitalism benefits uh, the oppressed. I was driving around in the streets of Pretoria, the capital of South Africa, once with a girl who acted as my guide, and we passed the cinema and I asked, well, are the cinemas segregated here? Then she replied, they used to be. Well, what happened, I asked. Well, what happened was that the owners of the cinemas closed them down until they were allowed to sell tickets uh, to the blacks. <laughs> I think that this is a beautiful example of the economic incentive uh, really making uh, uh, society more open. Uh, it, wa it was in their self-interest to extend uh, their business to the blacks <laughs> and therefore they battled for it and therefore it was brought about. Capitalism is the best friend in such societies of the oppressed. Well, I, I just but the to... oppressed don't rule. That's yeah. a real yeah. problem. Right. By definition. And Milton, a couple of years ago, you gave a great speech with your syllogism. You said socialism has not worked. It's proven. Capitalism has proven to work. Therefore, we need more socialism. And that, to me, seems to be some up. Do you still believe, believe that? Well, and... that's what I was really saying yeah. here about that's exactly the, what, the lesson we've drawn from, from, from Eastern Europe. Socialism is a failure. Capitalism is a success. And now the logical consequence of that would be that we'd have summits in Washington about how to dismantle government. But we didn't. We had a summit about how to expand government. So socially, we need more socialism. Does this tie in with the fact that as countries become more, more successful and, and more prosperous, then, then they're automatically going to move? I mean, the UK, after they were a great nation, and then, then the whole socialist system came in. Now we're seeing it. We saw it in Canada, and it's, it's flourishing. We see it moving in America. Why is this? Foolishness is a normal good. Well, well it could foolishness be. Foolishness is a normal good. It, it could be that there are some moral questions here that we sometimes tend to overlook. At the very beginning of his talk, Milton said something about we have more crime today, not because people are more criminal, but because of drug laws and institutional things. I basically agree with that, but I'm not sure it's true simply that people are not more criminally inclined these days. It may be that there is some form of moral decline, most of which I can blame on the government. I can say, look at the, how the welfare system uh, creates dependence um, and therefore a lack of self-respect and self-esteem and so on. But maybe there is moral decline. Maybe when societies get rich, people forget how hard, it, how hard you have to work in order to make a society work. And therefore, affluent societies do get to the point when people think they can have everything, they can vote themselves a living and so on. And, and maybe we have to think more about the problems of uh, individual responsibility and, and keeping that kind of uh, moral stature. Oh, I think you're right about the fact that moral values have declined because of these measures. In fact, uh, I feel very strongly that uh, my main complaint about the growth of government is not that it's making us poorer. It's not the economic effect. We have a very high standard of living. And if it doesn't get any higher, we're not going to be that badly off. Although that's easier for us to say than it would be for people who have much less than we of do. Of course. Uh, but even so, even the people who have much less than we do, uh, as you know, the average income of the people who are regarded as among the poverty stricken uh, by our artificial definition of poverty have a higher average income than all the people of the world. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, somebody remarked when he was talking to people in Russia, they were talking about how the Americans treat the blacks. And he is supposed to have said to them, well, you know, the average income of the blacks is three times the average income of all the people in Russia. <laughs> maybe it wasn't three times, maybe it was two times, but it's something like that. But you're right. Of course, there are people who are suffering. There are pockets of poverty. But, the, but all I meant to say along your line, was the main harm which is being done by the excessive government is the undermining of the moral fiber of the people, the undermining of our system of values by substituting the notion of social responsibility for the notion of personal responsibility. That, that nobody's responsible for anything. They're all victims, they're all, and just as in the drug case, you carry the medical analogy too far. Everybody suffers diseases. If a person goes out and shoots somebody, it isn't because he's a bad person. It's because he grew up in a deprived family or because he didn't get enough to eat when he was three years old or something like that. So I think you're quite right that the problem of, re of establishing and maintaining standards of morality and of values and of beliefs and personal responsibility 
is very difficult in an affluent society, just as it's difficult in an affluent family. But isn't there a paradox here? Because you say that it is necessary for a society then to have some kind of a common shared standard, moral standard. Now, that seems to lead uh, to some demands on the schools uh, that they would have this uh, uh, common moral standard. And it does seem to lead to a case for some perhaps very mild and uh, limited government intervention. I don't believe believe so. I believe that the way in which you get the common standard is by the free market in values, free market in... uh, Morris, how did we get a common set of values? Did government impose it? Did government tell people? No, I don't think that's right at all. How do we get tipping? I mean, they never taught me tipping in school. (laughs) People tip universally. Sure, I do agree with you there, sure. And so the same thing I think is true of schools. I don't think you need a government standard imposed. I got one way to separate out whether it's government or whether it's wealth that's, that's causing this lower moral, uh, lower standard of moral values. And that is, it, take a point in time, do you find relatively wealthy people in the United States imparting fewer moral values to their children than, say, middle class people or, or uh, lower class people? And I'm, it's not a rhetorical question. I don't know what the answer is. I don't is. know what the answer is either. I have no idea. I think we could all come up with anecdotes yeah. on both sides of that. I mean, we certainly know, uh, I mean, it, there's certainly a stereotype in America of rich kids who obviously got too much money and too little attention from their parents. Right. But we know of plenty of middle class kids who obviously haven't been trained in the social graces. Too. And many lower, lower kids, class. too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I just read an interesting article in The New Yorker about Singapore, which is a very interesting case study and maybe so weird that it isn't an example or anything, but it's been a very regulated uh, society and yet it's probably had the fastest economic growth in the world. Um, It's supposed to be the second richest country in Asia next to Japan, but people say if the Japanese could see the homes in Singapore, they would not think that they were ahead of the Singaporeans. Um, Never had any democracy, also not that much human freedom. Um, The press is not free. Um, you're not free to chew gum. They have all the, um, and yet people go there and they report the the amenities, the public civility. You know, the public toilets are perfectly clean. People are courteous. People don't cross against the light. You never have to worry about people running in front of your car. Um, well, you know, in some ways, the best of all forms of government is a benevolent dictator. If you can find a benevolent <laughs> one who is benevolent enough and wise enough, and who stays that stays that way. Lee Kuan Yew came close to fitting that that description for many years. As he's gotten older, he's sort of become somewhat more uh, arbitrary. But he did a, he he really was a benevolent dictator. He ran Singapore as if it were his own private preserve and as if it was his own family and his own property. And he insisted on these standards of morality and rectitude. But the problem is, how do you keep, how do you, A, how do you keep the dictator benevolent and how do you provide for success? How do you get him in there in the first place? And Lee Kuan Yew That's now right. is very much trying to turn the thing over to his son. And I don't think his son is as smart as Lee Kuan Yew. More important, he's not as, I don't think he has a wife as smart as Lee Kuan Yew's wife. It was really Lee and his, I remember I was in Singapore. Uh, oh, quite a number of years ago. And we had dinner with the Lee Kuan Yew and his wife, and he brought in a bunch of his uh, top bureaucrats. For the dinner, we had a discussion. And the only people who talked, except when spoken to, were Lee Kuan Yew, his wife, and me. <laughs> and Rose. <laughs> but none of these none of these bureaucrats opened their mouths unless Lee Kuan Yew told them to or asked them something. But I was very much impressed by Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew, who uh, was really very, very clever, very smart. But uh, I think that is really a very exceptional case, and it can happen. Well, since we probably aren't going to try to figure out who that should be here, no. let, me, let me go a different direction here. You talked about term limits, referenda. What about something that hasn't been looked at here in, in a long time in the U.S., and that is poll taxes? I mean, they have a very bad name because they're used in a really discriminatory way in the South. But what about the idea of making people pay a little something to get people voting who care enough about it or, or know something But about do we it? want to? I don't know. Do we want to get people voting? No, I'm saying. Oh, you want you to raise the cost of voting, you're get I'm sorry. voting. Yeah. You mean poll tax in the sense of a tax for the privilege of voting. Yes. Because Margaret Thatcher almost okay. surely 
is out of office today right. because of her attempt to impose a what I tax. think from an abstract point of view is a very intelligent idea. Yeah, I didn't mean a head tax. But I, it was I, politically I, absolutely disastrous. But a poll tax, well, you know, it's often been suggested that you ought to have educational requirements for voting. And I don't see anything wrong with that in a proper society. Do you? Well, no. Again, who sets the educational requirements? The educators. What do those look like? Uh -huh. yeah. If it just says you have to have graduated from the eighth grade or even from high school, that doesn't necessarily mean you learned much. Yeah. Can I raise a different issue? It is that uh, when I was listening to your talk, I was struck by uh, how to make the case uh, for uh, the free market, capitalism, classical liberalism, libertarianism, whatever we call it. Now, on one level, uh, the case is fairly straightforward. It is that we work harder, we enjoy the benefits uh, ourselves, and so on. Uh, common sense seems to require a wide dispersal of property rights, uh, so that people, the, the combination of the carrot and the stick to make us run faster. But on another level, it is a very complex issue because of the invisibility of our um, long-term consequences of our actions. And customs and tariffs is uh, one example. If we uh, limit the, the import of Japanese cars, then we forego uh, uh, the cheaper price, that is to say what is saved by the cheaper price, and that which we see saved by the cheaper price, we could use on something. So at the same time, as you can say, that the Japanese are destroying uh, jobs in uh, Detroit, they are creating jobs, namely the jobs that, that uh, are created as a result of us being able to save more of our money from buying uh, expensive American cars. But the problem is that this is the invisible part of it. So it seems to me that perhaps the task of, uh, of, of free market intellectuals is to make the invisible hand visible, to try to extend our uh, economic vision, to try to find out, and I think the Chicago economists have made a marvelous job of this, for example, find the invisible costs of government. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a very complex thing. And I think that we have to be very much aware of this as our task, as the, the, what we define as being our purpose, to make the invisible visible. There's no doubt about the difficulty of the task. After all, ever since Adam Smith wrote in 1776, 99% of all economists have been in favor of free trade. And yet, with, with rare exceptions, uh, very rare exceptions, we've never had free trade. However, and that, still hold, and that still holds true with the American Economic Survey of Economists of 28 issues. They're oh, still... yeah. But George, but, Stigler, as George Stigler used to say, if, the, if all of this propaganda by the economists kept tariffs 5% lower than they otherwise would be, it more than paid for itself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and in fact, I think you could make the case that they did. I mean, the average tariff rate after, with GATT after the Second World War went from something like 40% to 40% yeah. according yeah. to Bagwadi. That's a, that's a pretty big job. Isn't that what has really explained the prosperity of the world after the Second World War? Because there is another explanation going around in polite society, and it is that um, it was judicious government interventionism, that it was Keynesian uh, measures undertaken by governments and so on. But I do believe very strongly that it is precisely what we have been mentioning here. It is free trade and the opening of the world economy after the war. And what really worries me is that coming from Europe, that there might be a fortress Europe uh, mentality going on. And as Milton said once in a different context, in the corridors of power, among the bureaucrats, the voice of the consumer is like a whisper and the voice of the producer like a shout. And uh, this seems to me, when I look to Brussels, from my, my, my vantage point in Europe, to be very much the case, isn't it? I think you can even drop the word like. I mean, those farmers. But I, you must. Have, but your listeners will not understand that when you speak of Europe, you're viewing it from Iceland. Right. <laughs> At that point, I think we'll have to draw the, con uh, the discussion to a close. Thank you, Milton Friedman. Thank you, Sally Pipes, David Henderson, Hannes Gisarsson. That concludes this edition of the Laissez Faire Books tape series. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion and that you'll want to obtain the other tapes in the series featuring such challenging thinkers as Walter Williams, Harry Brown, and Charles Murray.